really excited about our guests this week. I feel like I've known, well, I have known them for years, but I feel like I've, I've never actually met them in person. Um, this week we have uh, the co-hosts of the public radio show, Away With Words. Martha Barnett is a former newspaper reporter and improv a member of an improv comedy troupe. So I wanna ask her about that. Um, Grant Barrett, a lexicographer, uh, he's helped produce dozens of dictionaries. I'm gonna ask him to name them. Um, I, if I understand his specialty is slang and jargon, but you'll know, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, and oh, he's also author of uh, The Perfect English Grammar. So we will we'll ask him what makes it perfect. Um, so welcome, Grant and Martha. You should unmute so you can uh, share your excitement. Oh, welcome. boy. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! Hey. laughs> Hi, Mark. It's nice to finally meet you. Nice yeah. to finally meet you in, in person. Grant, um, Grant and Martha have both been, and actually every guest up to now, has been uh, a judge in the ACES National Grammar Day tweeted um, poetry contest in different mm -hmm. years. So, um, so we've gotten to know each other through our love of poetry. Um, so first question, I first need to ask Grant this. Um, Grant is, is involved in American Dialect Society who does the word of the year competition every year. They tell us what was the most significant word of that year or significant in terms of uh, newness and, uh, and utility and lasting power. Uh, runaway favorite has got to be social distancing, Grant. Um, dude, we're not even halfway through the year. Yeah, I know, but come on. <laughs> it's, it, we, we can declare it now, can't we? Um, wow. The, I, was, I was reading Tony Thorne. He was interviewed by a newspaper. He's a sl British slang lexicographer, and he was saying he's collected more than a thousand pandemic-related words. He put a wow. query out on Twitter, Twitter asking people to submit wow. stuff, and Social distancing is a big one, but you know, there's a lot of pushback. People are saying they like physical distancing better, and maybe it's the people who are too logical when it comes to looking at language, but we might see that some of that pushback wins out and social distancing kind of falls away. There is often, um, uh, with the word of the year, a last in, first out problem, where mm -hmm. the, the late comers have a better chance of taking <clears throat> the vote. So the stuff that happens in December has a really good chance of winning. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Fair enough. But uh, I think I've already put my money on significant money on social distancing. So let's hope that yeah. uh, the, the odds makers don't, uh, um, don't disappoint me on that. So you've been, uh, how long have you been involved with the word of the year? So the early nineties, actually uh -huh. just, just, just after it started, I was a, a, a newbie, nobody, and they needed somebody to run the projector. <laughs> <laughs> the projector. That's so 90s. <laughs> Seriously, they didn't have anything. They didn't even have an overhead projector. With, with they had, see, I brought them the, the idea that you should have an LCD projector and put this stuff up on a screen. They were just doing it by voice and the hand counts. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you've been... Uh, I, I know you've been president of the American Dialect Society. No, I never have been. I've you never been vice have been. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just, oh, I'm, uh, I'm kind of a behind the scenes, uh, I'm deep state at the American Dialect Society. <laughs> I'm one of the guys who, <laughs> who does some of the scut work, you know, from year to year and doesn't ever really leave office, but kind of runs the website <laughs> and a couple of the email list and, you know, answers queries from members and year in and year out kind of just does the stuff that makes it run and helps the, you know, it's one of these little organizations with a few hundred members and it's been around since the 1880s and, you know, does its job and publishes a journal and pushes the field forward. And um, it's very collegial and very open arms to people of all, all interest levels from, from grade school students up to people who've been at it well into their nineties. I always, uh, I always, block out the time and follow on Twitter the, the fabulous um, uh, the, the debate. I mean, it's, it's like better than a, than a presidential um, <laughs> or a, a party um, uh, uh, meeting. It, it's, there's so much uh, give and take and 
um, and trends and so much in that. It's very exciting. If anybody hasn't seen that, I don't know when you're going to start getting the video cameras in and doing like an ESPN. I mean, maybe if we don't have sports back by then, we can, you know, do something with that. What, what is yeah. the, where's the next one? Uh, the next one, I should know this because I posted it okay. at, on our website at the American, di <laughs> American dialect .org, is going to be in San Francisco, assuming that the pandemic oh. uh, doesn't oh. prevent us from doing that. Sure. So you're talking about the word of the year vote when we all get together and vote. Right. Yeah, it is a lot like a convention floor, but it's, um, it's freewheeling like that, but it's not a bunch of stuffed shirts. It really isn't. It's, a, it's really lighthearted. And over the years, those of us who have been there a while have worked very hard to bring in a lot of new voices and young folks and turn it over to a newer generation. So I'm just kind of sitting there running the overhead projector and typing my goofy <laughs> comments on the screen and really encouraging the people on the floor to speak up, particularly if they represent new communities that we don't hear from and voices that don't often, often get heard, which is why uh -huh. if you look at the votes from the 90s versus the votes, say, the last five to 10 years, you see a real difference in the kind of stuff that's nominated and the kind of stuff that's voted on and the kind of stuff that wins categories and even the kinds of categories. And so uh, it's, it's way more interesting now to me than it used to be. It's uh, a lot less, um, a lot less like news driven, a lot more culture driven, if that makes sense. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I, the, I know that Grant, I, I knew that you were not original to the show. I just read that Martha, you were not actually, the show actually predates you also. So mm -hmm. how did Martha, how did you get involved in A Way With Words? back in the early 2000s? I think. Uh, yeah, I joined the show in 2004. Uh, our predecessors were Richard Letterer and Charles Harrington Elster. Charlie left the show. We were at KPBS at the time, uh, the mm -hmm. public radio station here in San Diego. And uh, they needed a new co-host. They found me in Kentucky, where I grew up, writing books on word origins with a terrible public speaking phobia, I'll have you know. I, <laughs> I you know, I, I, most of my professional career was as a writer, and uh, I was terrified, absolutely terrified, to get uh, in front of a microphone. Um, when my books would come out and the publisher would have me try to promote them, I would do readings, and I'm telling you, I would shake so badly and my mouth would dry out and my cheeks would stick to my, uh, you know, stick to my teeth and sell my dentures. And so I would try to drink water and I would spill it all over my, I mean, it was just, it was awful. But um, I had been a guest on the show before talking about one of my books. And, um, and when Charlie left the show, uh, they did a nationwide search. They found me in Kentucky writing books on word origins with this terrible public speaking phobia. But I just thought, what an opportunity to talk to hundreds of thousands of people every week about my passion. Uh, so I got over it. And that's actually part of the reason that I do improv comedy too, because uh, it, it helped me feel more comfortable uh, getting in front of audiences. And the other thing is that uh, although Grant grew up in, in Missouri, he, um, he spent a lot of time in New York and he has that New York sensibility and pace. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm a recovering Southern Belle from yeah. Kentucky. And so I needed to be able to think faster on my feet. And so that's part of the reason that I did that. But I joined the show in 2004 and it was 2006, I think, Grant, that you started Sit, or you joined officially in 2006? Yeah, I had filled in for Richard Letterer mm -hmm. a couple of times, and so that was kind of my first introduction. Yeah, exactly. But I started like you. I was a guest on the show once. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So and so they uh, did they do a nationwide search to find you, or was it uh, just because you? We did a reality or... TV show thing <laughs> where we had to do trial by fire, and it was a uh, trapped on an yeah. island together with wow. sharp and sticks and live. <laughs> Fire and cold. Yeah. It was strange. We formed an alliance. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. They voted everybody else off, and you're the survivors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So you you've been and you've been together for um for years and years, and I mean, do, do you get along okay? So, you know, uh, like siblings, you know, yeah. where yeah. we 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 love and fight like siblings do, you know, pretty much. That's about so, it. Yeah. 
So I, so I, so I, so I was happy to see that your producer signed up for the show, and I haven't seen that she's in here, but is, uh, is Stephanie Where's, Levine? Where's Stephanie? Uh, yes, You're Stephanie around. Levine is the, um, the tiny Hi. dynamo. Oh, I see Stephanie's iPad. Yep. That's where there I am. There she oh. is. Oh my God, it's Big I, Sister. I, I've heard your name. <laughs> behave, everyone. Behave. <laughs> behave, you two. <laughs> I, so I, I should really be asking you this question, and Martha and Grant can probably just turn their sound off for a minute. What's it like working with them? Are they, I mean, they seem really nice. They seem really friendly and warm on the show, but are they... Are they prima donnas behind the scenes or what, uh, how would you describe them? Mm, that's a great question. I'd say they're one, two sides of one very large brain and <laughs> they, they work really, really, really well together academically. And um, it's been a really great uh, joy to watch them grow as siblings, academic <laughs> siblings, I'll say. And I have to uh, spend a good chunk of the hour kind of reining them in because they do get lost in the finer points of usage, right. grammar, etymology, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so um, my job is, you know, chief wrangler in chief, making sure we get the show out on time and uh, that they are um, smiling at the end. <laughs> right. But in right. general, so it's, it, it's what you hear is what you get. Yeah. Who does the editing of the, the show? I mean, do you, do you script it to like to, to be an hour or is it like really long? No, it? it's about, it's about uh, two and a half to three hours edited to 52 minutes. Uh, we okay. have an editor uh, who does a first uh, draft edit and then it goes through another three, four, five edits. Um, uh -huh. Martha is involved in some of the editing and then I do edit and re-edit and re-edit. Uh, fine-tuned editing. So, but we have a, a great editor, Tim Felton, who has worked with us for as long as we've been independent, um, since about 2007. That includes calls that don't make it on the air. That includes bathroom oh. breaks. That includes... Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Plan. So, oh, okay. That includes Plan. calls that end up in other shows. So, it, yeah. It's, it's calls that end up process. in other shows? Do people call wrong number? And <laughs> no, 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 where you might do a recording session and just say, you might do a recording session and just realize, wow, there are a lot of downers in this call. Let's, let's separate these downers out and space them out among other episodes. Oh, so, okay. I, you don't have a lot of downers in one episode. Yeah, my brain, when you said other shows, my brain thought, you know, <laughs> other shows in the same no, studio. Other episodes. And, yeah, other okay. episodes yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So... Yeah. So you've been independent now, and we should explain this. So, uh, and this is something that you see everywhere in materials for Away With Words that you're not NPR, everybody uses NPR as shorthand for public radio station. Um, and, but you know, even the local public radio stations are not NPR, that's the national organization. Um, but you guys are not, not only are you not NPR, not public radio international, you're not, um, supported by that level. You're entirely uh, independent and all the money you get, and you give your show free to uh, stations to air. So all the money comes from donations and support. How, how's that working out? <laughs> <laughs> it's working, it's been working well so far. Uh, this is a, a game changer for everyone. And it's up to us to get hyper creative as to how we raise money in a in a an environment where um, underwriting is going to be difficult for everyone. Um, we kind of base our model off the public radio model of fundraising, so um, uh, direct listener donations and um, corporate, you know, some underwriting, some live events. Uh, which is no longer at the moment, but we're we're very busy recreating uh, that model. Right. Yeah, leaving uh, anything out, Grant or Martha? Um, yeah, we are planning a slate of live events for after the pandemic, assuming that that there is an after, and um, it, it's it's worked pretty well for us. And we were gratified to see that even NPR itself has understood that giving the show away for free 
is a good idea. And some of the shows that you hear nationally are given to stations at no charge because the NPR knows it can sell underwriting for those those shows and it, it works out. But it's it's a strange thing to 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 give your show out and people say, well, why don't you charge? And you're like, look, we give the show out because we want people to have it. We aren't in the business of charging these tiny stations. Most stations can't afford it. Most stations yeah. are nearly, you know, they're 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 skint, as the British say. They don't. <sighs> your big stations are the ones with the money, and so we give the show away, and we count on our listeners to support us. And we're in year what thirteen now, Stephanie? Fourteen? Year fourteen? Um, um yeah, thirteen, fourteenth uh, season, thirteenth year. Yeah, we've been um, at it, it a long time. Of it working, so we expect yeah. this to continue to work. So yeah, oh, we we're, do. We're trailblazers. <laughs> We do online fundraising uh, three times a year, and people step up. It's really yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. I, I checked my email, you know, guiltily before coming on to see when my last receipt was or acknowledgement. <laughs> I think it was 2011, but that doesn't seem right. It ah. seems like I've uh, seems like I've contributed to the show more recently. But uh, I listen to it on podcast. Um, I don't know that I get, I don't think I can get it here. I think I used to get it in West Michigan uh, years ago when I lived mm -hmm. there. Um, but really for the past 15 or so years, I've been listening to it on, on an iPod originally. And, you know. Where are you now, Mark? On. Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, we're not in Columbus. Yeah. It's really, there's two public radio stations here. We'll have to see if we can figure that out. How many stations are you on? Well, when we took over the show, we were on 12 stations in four states, and now we're in something like 330 signals Three. in over 40 states. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty so wide. We've grown it quite a bit. And I use signals because some stations yeah. are actually like collections of signals. Uh -huh. Like you might be on Wisconsin Public Radio, but that's 14 signals covering all of Wisconsin. So it's hard mm -hmm. to say, is that one station or is that 14? How do you, how do you phrase that? Yeah, and right. part of our challenge, part of our challenge in fundraising is the fact that we can't do fundraising on the air to our right. broadcast audience, which is by far our biggest audience. So it's it's the podcast folks and the folks who are in touch with us by email. Oh, so I hear the I hear the the little tags on the podcast, but mm -hmm. on the air you don't because you're stepping on the toes of the local station. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's right. They're essentially our landlords. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Our right. Um, so uh, the live shows, this is something I think you've just started the last couple of years that I've been aware of. You haven't come to Columbus yet, sadly. Um, but so Martha, you went from being afraid to speak in public. Now you, you actually go into auditoriums and you have hundreds and hundreds of people yeah, yeah, we, I mean, we appeared before thousands of people last year. Yes. Uh, if, you, if you add them all up, we did a nine city tour that included the Bell House in Brooklyn and, and Arcata, California, and, and where else? Indiana. Dallas and Washington. And, Dallas, um, Washington. Milwaukee, Madison. Milwaukee, That's right. and Madison. Yeah. Mm. And I got to tell you, it was so much fun. It's always fun to get out of the, that tiny studio and yeah and be face to face with real listeners who care about the same things that we do. Um, hmm. I, I had a blast. I think we both did. Yeah, it was really, it was really nice. Cause you, you don't know how stuff lands. Cause you say it in the video, there's a, there's a, there's a delay until it hits people's ears and then the email and the tweets and the Facebook comments come in and then you know how it lands. And it's like this, it's not the gratification you're looking for it's the like the feedback like how can i perform better how can i be better at this job but when you're on stage you, you know immediately how yeah. how you did or didn't do the bombs yeah. drop immediately <laughs> you know exactly how you failed <laughs> right or, and, and, or how you succeeded how you killed or how you bombed one way or the other so and you, when you do the show you do sort of the live format with the call in but it's it's actually taped and um you know there's always sort of the moment where Somebody asks a question, you ask a little bit of a follow-up as if you're thinking about it. And then you say, well, we looked into this and, and yeah, we did the research. Yeah, we, um, we don't hide it. We, we do the show like right. Car Talk used to do it. It was Car Talk just 
it's still a secret to a lot or surprise. Not, it was never a mm -hmm. secret either, but we don't do the show live. It's called Live to Tape. It's mm -hmm. a model that our producer, Stephanie, borrowed from Car Talk. Um, mm -hmm. You can't do a show like ours live because the stations that we're broadcast on don't carry it this time around the country. So you can't put it on the satellites at one time and say, everybody, you have to carry it exactly at this time. And so if you did that, you'd only get calls from one parts of the, some parts of the country, not from others, and that would kind of skew your show. So what you do is what's live to tape, which is when people call the toll-free number, they leave a message or they send a tweet or an email or whatever, and then you read their stories and their comments and you say, oh, that's interesting, let's get them on. And our producer, Stephanie, who, who we all, we've all met now, she reaches out and say, hey, you know what? We, we'd like to get you on the show. We're recording at this day and this time, and here's how it works. So what we do is we basically, if you imagine an airport, Stephanie is the traffic con air traffic control, and she stacks these <laughs> callers up like planes at an airport, all of them getting ready to land, and she brings them in <laughs> one at a time, bam, bam, bam. And Martha and I receive those calls, and we record them one after the other, almost as if it's live, and we take them, and we answer them. So we do know what they want to talk to us about, but it's still as if it's live. So there are always surprises. There's always interesting things that happen. It's still a real conversation. It's real conversation. It's right. real conversation, mm -hmm. and it gives yeah. us an opportunity to, um, it does give us an opportunity to say, you know, what research has been done on this since the last time we talked about it? Because frankly, Martha and I have been doing this for decades. Yeah. We've, we've encountered this stuff before. You know, if, you ever, if you've ever seen us live, um, Q&A is a big part of our live stage stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we've, we've been around the block. But <laughs> having the questions, <laughs> knowing what somebody wants to talk about on the show in advance is great. Because I can say, you know, what has been dug up recently on this? Because there's mm -hmm. always something new. What's this new book have to say? What if what are my colleagues at the American Dialect Society dug up? What, what's new? And I can say, was the title of that book what I thought it was? Was that date? Am I remembering that date correctly? And I just kind of get those details so yeah. that I'm not, like recently on the show, I, um, I misspoke and I said that the Polo Grounds was in Brooklyn. <laughs> so we do make mistakes. Um, and boy, did, I, did a lot of people let me know about that one. <laughs> um, so you do make mistakes even if you have prep, but you avoid more mistakes. So sure, sure. Yeah, the other you, thing you... is, Mark, we let the callers, sometimes we do retakes and it's nice. We let the callers shine. When the caller feels less pressure, the caller is better. The mm. caller is the third host, more or less. The caller can really, and you can talk to people who've been on the show, they really have an opportunity to just to, I, I don't know, they're less nervous. They're, what do you say, Martha? They just really, there's something more substantial about their presence if they're not feeling rushed, if they're not feeling that, mm. oh, the whole world is hearing me right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people do feel nervous. I think when they, when they call in at first, you know, they, they think mm -hmm. of it as their interview. <laughs> They'll call later and say, when is my interview going to be on? And <laughs> you know, it's a radio yeah. show. And, and I, so you, so they may ask the question and uh, you answer it and then you say, you know what, let's try it again and, you know, give them a second time if they have a, nervousness in their voice yes. or something that yeah absolutely and okay. and if their line is bad we might say oh your cell phone connection is weak can you go to a window or is there a better room yeah. in the house for this or um you know we can hear your dog barking is there can yeah. you close the door or something like that and we'll just start the, over and the really good thing about the car talk model um car talk like us is is a what they call a call out show in in the business and um when anybody calls as grant says it uh they get uh the voicemail and we have a database now of how many voicemails grant it's, it's like, 50, like 50 or 52 thousand 52 thousand voicemails that we have received over the years which is cool for research too because yeah. if we get a question about a word that we kind of vaguely think we know we can go through that database and see if you know somebody from Mississippi has also asked this question but as Grant said mm -hmm. Stephanie is constantly screening the rest of the talent uh, for the show that that third person and that's why mm -hmm. the callers were so good on car talk and why ours are usually by the time she gets them to the air um, they're pretty well prepped and and kind of ideally sparkling and, and lively, and we're looking for a diversity of, of age, of, of, 
ethnic background, of, of questions. Uh, it's a fantastic way to, uh, it's yeah. a great tool for putting together the show. Which, which makes me think about the, um, uh, the, the live show, because I imagine you both love your reference books. You both have many, many books that you go to. And, um, what, what's <laughs> yeah, it like right. on, on the live show? I mean, you, I, I assume you didn't, um, don't carry. I, I remember Ben Zimmer did a, uh, an ACES thing if, uh, many years ago where it was sort of this immediate, um, you talk to us and we'll give you your answers. Um, and Ben actually brought like two, a dictionary and the Garner's book and two or three other books to have up with him because he didn't trust himself to remember. He wanted to be able to check that. Do you carry books on stage or are you? I, I actually did. When I first started doing this with Richard Letterer, I remember several times I would, I would go on stage with books and, and dictionaries and I, don't, I stopped doing that, I guess, after Grant joined the show, because, yeah. <laughs> because his head is one big database for one thing. <laughs> but, but Well, um, um, no, because what you, what I, I, when I first joined the show, Stephanie taught me that I didn't have to know everything. I always felt really <laughs> guilty that I wasn't able to answer everyone's questions. And she kind of said, you know, you don't have to be the know-it-all professor here. And... I do have a ton of stuff on my laptop. We're both in the studio, for example, with our laptop laptops. Almost always what we're looking up is um, some uh, a pronunciation that we disagree on, you know, um, so we can do a retake where one of us says something that's not right and the other one says, are you sure? And then we can just clean that up. Um, sometimes we're digging up an email that we got. We're like, oh, oh, we should mention that email that we got from so-and-so because that was a really good follow-up. And then we'll mention that like after a call. But, mm -hmm. but nine times out of 10, you're moving so fast, whether it's a live stage performance or on the air, that looking things up in a book or even on your laptop is, it, it breaks the tempo. Yeah. It's like, a, yeah. how to put this, it just ruins the moment. It, it, it means that you're, it's like being at, uh, on a date and you're looking at your phone instead of your, your, your romantic partner. That's really what's happening. You're, you're not being attentive to your lover. And you, you should not be looking at your device or your book, really. Uh, yeah. Um, and often, so, the, often the, the Q and A is the best part, I think, of our live shows. I mean, sometimes it just goes on and on and on, and and we have been asked to turn out the lights, like like the organizers leave and they ask us to turn out the lights because <laughs> people keep, you know, all all of these coordinators here. I mean, I mean, we love this stuff. Yeah. yeah um. I, and, and I hope that we can have some time um, to talk about uh, some of the, get to some questions um, from audience members. So if you have a question, I, I haven't been able to keep track of the, the Zoom group chat because I'm looking at the at this screen instead of that screen. Um, and, it's, and it's actually very easy to get distracted by looking in. So well, this is really an interesting comment uh, that people are making in the chat window. So feel free to make those chats or comments in the chat window. And if you have any questions, let Heather know, uh, you know, if you, um, if you have any questions about the, how the show is made, about um, what Martha and Grant are doing with their, with their time now, uh, anything like that, um, go ahead and ask and we'll try to get to some questions. And, when, and I have that question, actually. Let's, let's, let me ask that. What are you doing with your time? Is the show... Um, is the show sort of on the hiatus? Are you taking a break until things you're able to get back together? I mean, I know you have a new episode last week that I listened to. Um, what's the prognosis for continuing? Well, actually, just this afternoon, I took delivery of a microphone and some other equipment. So we're oh. tricking out our homes. Uh, Grant is already tricked out there, and um, I'm tricking out the bedroom closet. And uh, we're going to be uh, testing some. Um, uh, recordings at home. Oh, Very exciting. Soon. Exciting. Yeah. Okay. Well, other um, than that, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say we do have a question that popped up. Oh, please. Yes, from Aaron. Aaron, if you want to unmute and ask. Hey, I just unmuted. Hey, Grant, Martha, and everybody else I know out there. How are you doing? Um, I, I put it in the chat. I've, I wanted to always call in for the last couple of years and ask uh, about the origins and any other fun stuff you can tell us about the word bunk 
My brother and I used to say it as kids all the time. Bunk. It was like Biff. We would go bunk for anything that was lame or bad or, you know, anytime we had to do chores, that's bunk. And it's <laughs> wondering off the top of your heads, don't be reaching for a book and I don't break the flow here. But what you thought about the word bunk, its origins and any other fun stuff you might want to. Um, so you're not out. thinking about it as a origin for, you're not thinking about it as a term for um, an interjection or exclamation in a comic book. You're thinking about it meaning rubbish or garbage or a lie or something fake, right? Well, we, yeah, or just displeasing or, you know, like we, we used to say that when our mom would ask us to do hmm. chores. Oh, that's bunk. Like we had to go do a chore instead of, um, you know, riding our bikes or whatever. Yeah, there's a there's a really this interesting because it's a known word origin which we don't often get, which which is super great. This comes from an expression which is um, a county. Is it North Carolina? Yeah, North Carolina. Yeah, the Buncombe, Buncombe, Buncombe County. Buncombe County, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We um, we know that. Bunk is short for bunkum, B-U-N-K-U-M, which is an alteration of bunkum, B-U-N-C-O-M-B-E, mm -hmm. the name of Carolina. The question, they used to say, how did it go? I'm, um, there was, a, there was a politician. There was a politician yeah. who was arguing in Congress and making long, long speeches, and he would say, you know, well, that wasn't for the other guys on the floor. That was, that was for the folks that's back right in the that was for that effect, yeah he would he would make long speeches to get it in the news it would be printed in his home market where obviously people were vote, voting for him so um that's it so it comes from that um there have been some other preposterous theories proposed but it really literally <laughs> comes from this one politician talking to his home county in the newspapers yeah so we get debunk from that as well of course that's right that's so cool that's really uh I, that was um, amazing that you guys have that off the top of your head. Very cool. <laughs> Thanks. Have you had that? You've had that one before? Yes. I think we and, have. And actually, I, the reason I've had it before is because I spent a stupid amount of time debunking the people who have the preposterous theories for bunk. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I did not think about debunk. So that's interesting that that's, uh, um, that's I, I've learned something there. I, I kind of knew, I knew about the bunk and from bunkum but not from, but I never thought debunk, which it seems like a more legitimate word mm, or word it? we use and that we think of one as slang, I think, and one is not. Oh, interesting. But, yeah, I yeah. think you're right. That's, I have those kind of, they're marked that way for me as well. Yeah. Is that the Dictionary of American Regional English next to you on the bookshelf, Grant? Yes, I do. I have all the volumes of that. Also, the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English and then the three volumes of Green's Dictionary of Slang, although the online version is more complete of that. Uh, and what, what was your involvement with the Green's Dictionary? Did you edit the last? No, I had no involvement with that, although I know that no, oh, Green sorry. and occasionally will send him some little tidbits that I think will, uh, like little corrections and things. He's a good guy. So, so what are the dictionaries that you've been involved with? I, um, I was involved with the resuscitation of the Historical Dictionary of American Slang, which was first edited at Random House. The first two volumes were done there. Um, then it was brought over to Oxford University Press. They got a NEH grant for that and then brought on as the editor for that. That was my first major dictionary editing job. Uh, unfortunately, the NEH did not renew their grant support and so no other volumes were published. Uh, I was responsible for bringing it over from paper and digitizing it and all of its many thousands of citation cards, turning it into XML, teaching the editors how to edit XML, rolling out the whole digital thing. And uh, uh, unfortunately, with no federal funding, OUP had no interest in finishing it. Sure, sure, okay. Um, and so I have, pictures, but. so I have, uh, I, I have to do, I, I don't, you know, we, you, you when you do your show you you do phrases and that's the the main part of the show is sort of these phrases where they came from and um regionalisms um and so i don't i don't want to like burden you with doing another version of away with words but i did ask my mother who's 95 and uh from bedfordshire england oh boy. um some of the expressions that she uses and growing up 
and not just growing up, but every time my wife and I go down to visit her, she'll say something and we'll say, where the heck did that come from? What does that mean? Um, so I have a, so I asked her for a bunch and she gave me actually like three dozen. I'm not going to ask you wow. all three dozen, <laughs> but I've got, but I've got a few. We're not I've going anywhere. Well, <laughs> you're not doing anything, right? You've got your toys to play with, your new uh, microphone and stuff. That's true. Um, so uh, I'll just throw out a few. And if you, if you don't know them, that's fine. Um, uh, uh, she would say, um, when something isn't going right, and, you know, where we go out to the store and they don't have something, we, you know, whatever. It's, uh, she says, like a Fred Carnos outfit. Say it again, please. Fred Carnos outfit. Did you ask is, her how she spelled that in the last part? Um, she spelled it wrong, but I, because I looked it up. It's K-A-R-N-O, it's possessive, Fred Carno's outfit. And Fred, as in the man's name, Fred? Yes. Now, you do have the answer, so if you don't, K -A -R -N -O you haven't heard it. K-A-R-N-O what? Apostrophe S, outfit. Also, um, and it's a legitimate, it's a real person. Interesting. And um, well, I'm okay. cheating. I'm looking it up as well. Yeah, on my, we, on my we marker, my, I can tell. I'm hands free. The TVI is going back and forth. I, I'm looking it up in my. Um, <laughs> I found it in my vaudeville old and new encyclopedia. Oh wow! Wasn't he a vaudeville performer? He was a British music hall performer. So yes. yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, he led something called uh, Fred Carno's Army, right? Yeah. Right. And the um, outfit and the, is less common than it is. Sometimes it's called Fred Carno's Army. Right. Uh, and sometimes it was this, known as Bunk Carno or Brother Carno, Comrade Carno. Not familiar with that. I'll ask my mother. Um, in Adrian Room's Dictionary of Pseudonyms, he's got a couple names of him there. Hmm. So why did she, how did she use that? Tell everyone about how she used it. She uses it as something, uh, something just going awry. And I think that Fred Carno as I've read, which I never heard of it either, was um, known for slapstick. And uh, interestingly, two of the people in Fred Carnot's army army were uh, Stan Laurel and Charlie Chaplin. So oh, interesting. those those names we certainly know. Um, so that's how they got their that's how they kind of got their start or got their leg in the business. Right, and this is a World War One term that uh, you know I think it originated probably in the army in World War I where things weren't going right. And they said, it's, this is a Fred Carnot's army or Fred Carnot's outfit. Yeah, I'm looking at Eric Partridge's 1984 edition of his Dictionary of Slang and Unconventional English. And that's what he says. He suggests it comes from the uh, British Air Force in World War I around um, prompt, uh, yeah, 1915, 1918. That's what he suggests. Okay. And she had no, she's born in 1925, but uh, she had no yeah, idea of your these, origin. But. Sometimes these terms hang on. One of the, Mark and I have talked about this before, and something we really like is when we get these terms that are two, three, even four generations on, and they're so disconnected from their roots mm -hmm. that when we tell people the origins of them, people are flabbergasted that something has lingered this long, and just they're blown away. But I, I love the idea. I would, I love it when there's just this history behind something that old. Yeah. Now, do you get now with my mother? I, there are some things that she said that I told her the origin, you know, things that she was convinced were British. And I said, well, actually, it turns out it's American. Um, Great Scott, she thought was um, based on Scotland Yard. She always had that assumption. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, actually a, a, a general early 19th century, mid 19th century American. Yeah. She wouldn't o believe me. has I, a good entry on that, I think. Yes, and she wouldn't believe me. And I, and I went to the OED and, and she said, well, I would think the English would know better than, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, we should get Lynn Murphy on to tell us all about that because she will, yeah. she will talk about the English and their insistence that they, because they're English, they must be more correct. <laughs> uh, there you go. Well, uh, we will have Lynn Murphy on in uh, three weeks, I believe. So um, so we're looking forward to that. I actually think Lynn's, in, Lynn's watching us now. Yes, yes she, she sure is. Yeah. Yeah. And she has a question. Oh, uh, we have a couple of questions on deck, actually. Okay. Um, I think, how about Bob Hunt? Do you want to ask your question first? Well, hi there. This is a, can you hear me? Hi, Bob. Yeah, hi. hi there. Yeah, a little bit nervous. I've been in the, the Facebook group for like 10 years now. I love your shirt, dude. Um, oh, yeah. Check that out. Eh? 
Oh, look at that. Oh, whoa. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you, Bob? Where do you live? I, I uh, lived uh, next Vancouver, British Columbia, but I've just moved to Manitoba here in the last month. So okay. Big deal for me, but uh, yeah, Fraser Canadian. Valley, British Columbia. Yeah. Well, welcome. It's nice to talk to you. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, basically, I'm wondering if uh, you have seen a linguistic shift in in a parody or an understanding, you know, it, I guess, um, you know, it's more of a normal versus formal now instead of this linguistic discrimination or have I just fallen down this uh, podcast hole with the vocal fries? Like I think, you know, they're fantastic and things like Talk the Talk out of Australia, which is changing their name to Because Language mm -hmm. uh, in the next month here. Um, uh, I'm just wondering if, you've seen the average American or North American um, be more accepting of different vocal registers? Um, first, I want to say those are two great podcasts. The Vocal Fry, uh, Vocal Fries, look that up, everyone. That's exactly what it sounds like. Vocal Fries is an exceptional podcast. It's far more wonky than us, but they do really great stuff. And then talk the talk, look it up. They'll probably link to the new podcast from the old one that's Australian, and they do a lot of current events, linguistic stuff. Um, to answer your question, um, Martha, this is a tough one because um, we may be in the same bubble you're in, Bob. I'd like to think that people like us and the Vocal Fries lady and Gretchen McCulloch of Lingthusiasm and Daniel and Ben and everyone at talk the talk and people like Lynn Murphy and the folks at the Linguistic Society of America and the folks at the American Dialect Society and uh, all the people in the sociolinguistics community and I mean there's just a huge number of people that I know who are doing the work of trying to normalize this idea that there's no such thing as an accent and there's no one right language and we all um we need to open our minds a little bit more and that when you have a judgment about someone else's language it says more about you than it does about the other person and yet i think we're in a bubble martha wouldn't you say that maybe our bubble is hard to break out of to get a real true picture of what is actually happening out there yeah i think bob knocked me off because i just came back into the meeting but uh but i agree oh. with everything you said in the last 10 seconds we're that the bubble that we're in is because you and I and people in our podcast community and the linguistics community and the social linguistics community, we are trying to normalize this idea that judgments about language tend to come with a lot of isms. They tend to come with a lot of, they tend to represent um, the judger more than the judged, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, that it's a stand-in or a proxy for finding a way to criticize somebody about something else. We like to say that we're a spay and neuter program for pet peeves. <laughs> because really, that's the least interesting thing about language, isn't it? People's peeves about this and that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lynn, uh, Lynn Murphy just uh, shared on Twitter yesterday a great short video that won an award about... Uh, language in England and people who are language purists and, uh, and the sort of the, the violence and the, um, I mean, it's, it's a comedy thing. It's uh, the violence is all um, for, played for laughs, but it was very, it was very interesting message in that video. We'll have to get a link on the, if we can, or maybe Lincoln, Lynn can share it with us. Um, but I did, I did write down that, that's a great question because I think, you know, I'm probably in the same bubble and I wrote that down because next week we have David Crystal uh as our guest and so he um maybe as an observer of that very thing he may be in the same bubble but he may uh have some uh at least in england of you know whether people are more accepting or less accepting i mean i think you know even uh eat shoots and leaves lynn truss sort of uh people criticize the book but it brought it out there that you know it's a it's a it's a comedic book about language peevery. Um, and I think it brought up the question of when, when we're peeving about language, is it, um, is there a basis for this? Are we, are we doing this for a, 
uh, a reason other than we just want to preserve what we think is right and everybody else is somehow different. So. Uh, you're asking us to answer that? No, no. It's I rhetorical. Just trailed off there. It's just rhetorical. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But no, I think it's a good question. I think it's something that you deal with. Um, you know, you, you deal with people who are you do deal with people who come in and say, you know, my great aunt used to say this, and then you also deal with in the last uh, show you had um, uh, somebody asking about comprise and compose, which is a real um, difficult thing that some people would get worked up about, and some people are uh, say, you know, it's no big deal. There is there's sort of a right way, but is it such a big deal if uh, if we don't follow the right way? Um, so it's a good, it's a good question. I think that's uh, that we're dealing with, dealing with. So I want to, if I could, answer the question that Lynn Murphy asked in the chat. Sure. Is is Lynn? Uh, we, we'd like to have them actually come up. Where is Lynn? Hi, Lynn. Yeah, we should have Lynn come up and ask the question. Can I can I rephrase what I what I wanted to ask essentially? <laughs> no, you have to answer what I, what I what I wrote, or you can answer this. How do you think it's changed this kind of radio answering people's questions since so many answers became so much more available on the internet? So what's the relationship between what people find out from you and what they could find out on the internet? Oh, it's, I mean, books, whole books and perhaps whole careers I've been based upon the idea that there's no such thing as respect for authority anymore. And Martha and I don't necessarily consider ourselves authority, but sometimes I feel people come to us because they've chosen us as their particular authority over whatever randomness they find on the internet. Because when you go to the internet for, for an answer, how do you know? I mean, how do you pick? who? you need an arbiter you need a judge what is your criteria what how do you know that this answer is because it's first in the queue because it's on page one you know i could tell someone that if my quinian's page comes up that's a good answer right um and, th and that's good i often send people michael quinian's pages and say michael quinian's stuff is solid or something off of your blog lynn or ben zimmer's articles and uh you know a link to a book on archive.org or something off of our website or some, something from Gretchen McCulloch. But um, the random person doesn't know. So I, I don't think it's changed all that much. I do know that I have a hard time convincing people to listen to our show sometimes that, that they come to us, they ask an answer, ask for an answer, we give them an answer and they still prefer what they came with in the first place. So even then, sometimes it's not enough. I remember uh, we had a question about the origin of it's a doozy. And we talked about, oh my God. <laughs> we talked about the Duesenberg automobile. Everyone insists it's the Duesenberg automobile. And I explained the time, the timing doesn't work. That the Duesenberg automobile didn't exist until 13 years after the question first appears in print. You know, that this, it didn't happen. It couldn't have happened. And a guy replied to me, he said, well, I like my story better. And he wasn't being funny or ironic. That's actually what he wanted to believe. And this frequently happens to me. Where I'll say, look, here it is, just timing, newspapers. You know, it just doesn't work out. I have it in print decades before your story could even possibly be true. Um, so I don't know. I guess to, to go back, sometimes people call us because they don't want an authority. They simply want to be heard. And that's an important part of it. They want to communicate with another individual and share experiences and can communicate their thoughts and their worries and their, their own ideas. And they wanna check. They wanna, they wanna bounce an idea off of somebody else. It's not really about finding truth or answers. They're not looking for a reference desk. Yeah, I would, I would agree with what Grant said about people wanting some kind of curator for all that vast knowledge that's out there. And, and the other point that, that people want to connect. I mean, where else in public radio do you get this opportunity to 
share these kinds of, of ideas and thoughts about language uh, with other people. People are always wanting to use our show to, I think, connect with other people. You know, they, they noticed that or they, they suddenly remembered something that their Aunt Matilda said. And, and they just want to connect with people who feel the same way, like we're doing now. Yeah. Is there a part of the, over the years you've been doing this, is, could you, have you identified a part of the country um, where that's the richest for these call-ins? I know we have, uh, you know, my sense would be that uh, the Appalachian uh, has a sort of a different approach to, to language sometimes. Um, is it the South? Is it Texas? Is it California? Does everybody have their own sort of way of uh, uh, talking? I, I have a theory that if you look at uh, any good dialect map and you find a place in the dialect map where two isoglosses meet, that is an isogloss is a prominent dialect region, two or more, for example, Indianapolis, where we are on the air, um, so three isoglosses roughly meet there, we get a large number of calls because we have lots of cultural conflicts happening between people who speak different regional dialects. Those are where mm -hmm. we get the most calls. I mean, mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think the calls we get from Indianapolis are out of proportion to the size of Indianapolis itself. Well, now, the other thing that we have is Dallas, Fort Worth is our largest market where we're on the air and have a good time slot on the radio. Um, and also Texans just like to talk about themselves. So we get a lot of calls from Texas. So. <laughs> well, the Texans are laughing right now. <laughs> <laughs> laughing but a, with a third, recognition. A third of our calls are from Texas. Wow. It, it could very quickly become, to become a way with Texan words if we let it. <laughs> get, is San Diego a big, uh, a big part of that? Uh, yeah, yeah, but they yeah. have, uh, we've, we've kind of become a, uh, they've moved us around the dial it's our home market they've moved us around the dial enough that we kind of reconditioned the, the the spot here they'll move us in a spot we'll warm up a spot on the schedule and then they'll move us to another spot and that spot that we've warmed up they'll put a new show in so uh, it's, it's kind of like um we're house sitting until they put in a new show in the place that we've warmed up <laughs> well we that's your serving questions about phrases and expressions what's that we do have two questions about phrases and expressions. Fire away. All right, we have Allison's question. Allison, if you want to unmute. I'm unmuted. Hi, guys. Uh -oh. um, what a treat to talk to you. So, so here's one that I've been noticing, and I, I've never seen it among the things you've talked about. Um, I have always said, I've never set foot in that place. And lately I'm reading, I've never stepped in that place. And I don't know if it's regional, if it's coming over from Britain, if it's an age generational thing. What do you guys think? Interesting. I wonder which one is older, Grant. I would guess set foot. And I and don't. Do you have a, do you have, a, have you noticed something yourself, Allison? <clears throat> well, I, I'm a New Yorker living in Virginia. Um, <laughs> I, I have always, and, and in my 60s, I've always said set foot. I've never seen stepped foot. It kind of came on to my view about the same time on accident came in, and I know you've dealt with that. Mm, yeah. um, I, I, don't, I think it might be generational. I don't know, but I read it all the time now. Mm. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm not seeing any data. I don't know of any data. This has come up a numerous times, and every time I look at it and consider it for the show, they look to see if there's any new data on it. Um, and I don't know of any data that's been gathered that finds that there's any difference. These are just two similar phrase, two phrasal verbs that exist that have roughly the same meaning, and there's no real prominent variation in them, as far as I could have ever been able to tell. Okay, thanks. I did, I did just do a quick uh, Google Ngram viewer on stepped foot in and set foot in. And interestingly, there does seem to be you know, I, I don't know if it's enough to, to be a statistically relevant, but it does seem to be a small uptick in stepped foot in. But in an edited book scanned by Google, set foot in is vastly uh, outnumbers a uh, few cases of stepped foot in. 
Yeah, but you may be right. You may be I'm super something. distrustful of ingrams and have stopped using it as a as a as a source for any kind of conclusions. Well, fine. Thank you guys. All right. Was there and then another? The other one came yeah. from Rick. Hi guys. Hi Rick. This one might be a slam dunk for Grant. It, it, you you wrote a book or were, were involved in the creation of Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English, huh? I was not involved in it. Oh, you were not. It's just on your bookshelf. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I have it right here. It's a fine work by Michael <laughs> Montgomery, who unfortunately passed this past year. He passed away. There is a second edition. Yeah, that I have is in it the right works. here too. <laughs> There's, wow. a, there's a second edition that's in the work in in, in process if uh, funds can be found by his compatriots to finish it. It's an exquisite work. It's fabulous. But I'd be hard pressed to pick which one of the weird things. I didn't know they were weird, of course, because I grew up with them. But the one I I was specifically asking about. Sorry, it just fell away. <laughs> there it is. That my parents and my grandparents used, and I've now used it, and I'd get some weird looks. Is I know what side my bread is buttered on. Have you heard that expression before? Yeah. You, yeah, use it. you have. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's used to mean like it, giving an apple to your teacher or laughing at the, the boss's joke. That's what a person would do if they know what side their bread is buttered on. But yeah, the expression doesn't make any sense to me. So I don't know if it was just something my parents said. or what. Well, why doesn't it make any sense to you? Because what difference would it make what side <laughs> the bread is buttered on? <laughs> Yeah, but you know, with idioms and idiomatic expression, you can't really look at them too closely because they tend to break down. You know? Is it specifically something from the Appalachian region? Is it something? No. Oh, no. It's much older than that. Um, I, I'm looking at, wow, this looks, might have more depth to more, more history than I thought. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy here. Hold on a second. Maybe we need for you to call the show yeah this is an interesting one okay mm. um i'm just trying to find mm. actual the a, a first date on this oh yeah here we go F uh 1500s this shows what? up in a Holy shows, shows up in a book of uh, shows up in a book of proverbs and epigrams from the 1500s Did, does it say where from um, it wouldn't be Appalachian then. <laughs> not, not uh, no no obviously if it's from the 1500s it certainly must be english to begin with yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, my, my, my family tree does come from there, so it could be. They said yeah, a lot of yeah. I assume it's just general English. My other favorite one was, I'll bet that jarred your granny. The that jarred like your a, granny? That means if you really banged your elbow hard, oh, man. Yeah, but that one jarred your granny. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> never heard never that heard. one. I never heard no. that one either. That's good. I like that. So, so that's like, it's kind of like the parents saying, I will knock you, I'll knock you, I'll hit you so hard, your grandkids will be born wobbling. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you guys. I appreciate that. Aaron had a follow-up actually for you both. Okay. Grant, you said that um, you don't really trust Google Ngrams and I wondered why. And Do you work on it? Did you build it? <laughs> no, no, but I will sometimes use it as a resource. So if it's distrustful, I don't want to use it. Well, um, part of the problem I have with it is that when I, I know the problems with it, when I post it out there, people take it as a gospel. I'm going to put in chat a Wired article from 2015, which kind of summarizes the general issues with it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I think that we're good with questions for now. It's, a, it's over an hour. I, we always manage to go through it quickly. I did want to ask you both. I don't know if I really asked you how you're doing. Um, you're both in San Diego. You're both at home with mm -hmm. family and um, yeah. you have enough toilet paper, enough uh, eggs and bread and butter to put on your bread on one side. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, what I'm doing uh, besides the work on the show is I'm taking a physics course Oh. Uh, online because my stepson Griffin is home from the University of Hawaii where he's studying physics and my wife Bonnie and I wanted to be able to talk with him about it. Oh, and wow. I've never had physics before and most of it goes right over my head, but there's a Coursera course taught by a guy from Virginia 
uh, Lou Bloomfield at the University of, uh, of uh, Virginia there in Charlottesville. And he's sort of like, like Mr. Rogers, only physics for adults. Mm. And so I've been taking physics. My wife and I have been doing physics uh, every night. We've learned about ramps and falling balls. Last night we did bumper cars. And I'm also <laughs> finding it's really interesting that etymology is not serving me well with physics. Why so is that's that? been my practice. Well, because it's a whole other language. I mean, I find it really mm. difficult. I never had it in college. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the etymologies of all these words as he's talking about acceleration and don't even get me started on inertia. It's just, <laughs> yeah. So ask me again about physics in a few weeks, but we're doing that and we're doing, um, she's also making me do uh, a video series called Go Sleeveless in 14 Days. So we're on day 10 and that's why I'm wearing long sleeves. <laughs> this is an exercise. Uh, yeah, yeah. Lifting yeah, weights. Yeah, like yeah. Books a lot. That's got to be yeah. <laughs> good. Right? Yeah, the dictionary of Smoky Mountain English. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, Grant, are you uh, put you on the spot? Are you uh, learning physics or? No, no, I'm not. And I'm fine with toilet paper. If I run out, I have dictionaries. No. Oh. <laughs> There's a lot of blank. <laughs> There's a lot of blank pages in the front of every you know every issue issue. So. All right. No, well, doing we a should, lot of gardening. That's what I'm, how I'm spending my time. Oh, nice. All right. Well, we should wrap up. I um, guess we're, we've gone over an hour. Um, I appreciate everybody being here. We've had 60-some uh, people come in, and we're still at 58, so they stuck with it. So that's a good sign. Um, great to finally talk to you face-to-face, -face, as we said. And uh, I'm going to try to do the, the intro again, because, like I said, we paid a lot of money for this intro. Um, so what I need to do is I need to share screen. This may work, it may not, but thank you all for coming. And next week, uh, we're looking at a, a terrific show with uh, David Crystal, um, English uh, linguist who's written literally, uh, I forget how many, 120, 160 books, a wow. crazy amount. So, uh, so thank you all very much. And uh, if you liked it, come back next week and we'll do it again. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.